Guess what? Goalie Nutrition is sponsoring Hard Knock Life, and you can go to goalie.com to buy apple cider vinegar gummies. They're ashwagandha gummies, super fruit gummies, and super greens gummies. And you get 10% off plus free shipping if you use the code HARDKNOCK at goalie.com. This is honestly, I've been taking the goalie gummies now for, for a couple weeks, and I have to say, they're tasty and they're good for you. Have you guys been enjoying the goalie gummies? I really like them. They're yummy, but it's a nice to add to my like routine of already like I normally take just straight vitamin C. So it's nice to have like extra supplements. For a long time, people have, have praised the benefits of apple cider vinegar. And, you know, as someone who's had to like drink straight apple cider vinegar sometimes when I'm not <laughs> feeling well or, you know, I have a, some joint pain and your mom is like, drink some apple cider vinegar. It's mm. not the most appetizing home remedy let's just say no, right it tastes horrible so, like the apple cider part is like ooh, does it taste like apple cider it is like no it tastes like vinegar but acv is very good for you and the fact that goalie has been able to put the acv into these tasty little gummies made with pectin and fruit peels which make them vegan which is cool so if you're vegan you can still rock these gummies because everyone knows gummies are usually made out of like gelatin and nasty shit this these are made out of complete non-GMO, gelatin-free, gluten-free, vegan ingredients. And you can get the benefits, all of the benefits of apple cider vinegar taking these tasty, delicious, convenient gummies. So go to goalie.com and use the code HARDNOCK. That's H-A-R-D-N-O-C, just like the podcast you're listening to. Get 10% off your purchase of Goalie products and free shipping. It's a much better delivery device for that apple cider vinegar. Yeah. These, these Goalie gummies are great. You get I it and it's, it's a delicious little candy. And I, I've been enjoying the Superfruits one. I did feel kind of refreshed after taking a few of those. Yeah, no, but I'm loving them so far. And they're definitely tasty. If you just want tasty gummies, at least just <laughs> eat them for the, the, like, the yummiest. Yeah. yeah. So go to Goalie.com, use the code HARDNOCK, H-A-R-D-N-O-C, get 10% off your purchase and free shipping at Goalie.com with the code HARDNOCK. I'm Lin-Manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I am Keith Chow. I'm Brittany Monet. It's just the two of us this week, Brittany, but we got a multiverse of stuff to talk about. We sure do. Let's see. There was Moon Knight and, of course, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Let's go in chronological order and talk about Moon Knight first, and then we'll get to multiverse maybe after the break. But before we get to all of the Marvel goodness, I just wanted to ask, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I got a tattoo since the last time we I talked, saw so. that on Instagram. If you follow Brittany on Insta, you'll see that she got herself her first tattoo, is it? Yes, yes, yeah. What compelled you to get inked? Well, I've always wanted a tattoo, but like I was kind of glad I never had money when I was a little bit younger to do it because I probably would have got like something really stupid and meaningless <laughs> at the time. So I actually ended up getting one of my favorite Pierce the Veil songs, which I've been a fan of Pierce the Veil since I was like 17. And I'm going to be 32 this month. So, you know, I feel like they're one of those people that I'm in the long haul with them. Well, if you like a and band for 15 years, I guess that's that's dedication. Yeah. Right. So I got it's actually from one of their more recent songs. The song is called Floral and Fading. You see the design. It's a faded rose with the, some of the lyrics of the song, like kind of like in a circle around it. So, yes. Did it hurt? It, like, the first little bit kind of did, and then after that, you're like, all right. And then the, like, lettering on the sides hurt a little bit, and then when she was done at the end, she used, like, white ink to, like, give more definition to the rose. And, like, that needle, I think it was smaller than the other one, so that one kind of hurt a little (laughs) bit more than, like, yeah. But it wasn't as bad as, like, I had built it up in my head to be. I mean, do you kind of see, like, you know, there are people, once they get their first tattoo... It almost becomes an addiction and you start like yeah, adding to I, it I'm and already, getting a sleeve and getting, you know, is that... I'm already planning. I want to get um, Anakin's lightsaber tattooed next. Nice. Yeah, I just don't know how big yet. So depending on how big, it'll either be like, you know, super cheap or... You know you know what you yeah. should do, right? You get just the hilt first on your forearm mm-hmm. and then come back and then get the blade. On the other arm? Or, or just like, you know, just, just do the hilt first and then... 
it just keep adding to the hilt so that until you have like the full blade so you're like slowly igniting the lightsaber over like a number of years <laughs> oh my gosh and then get the red one on the other side <laughs> see i was i was thinking of getting both kylo ren's and anakin's lightsaber oh okay you should get anakin's on one side and then vader's on the other so just have the matching set oh that's the other thing we got to talk about we have our first full Obi-Wan trailer. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my god, what a trailer that was. I mean, you you didn't see him, but but your boy Hayden Christensen's presence was definitely felt in, in that trailer. Yes. Oh my god. I loved the trailer, first of all. But yeah, I really loved the end of the trailer where you start seeing them putting together the suit. And then you hear the breathing, and uh, it was done so well in, you know, Obi's face. Like, it might not even be from that exact scene, right. but, like, the way they put it together was very nice. And, yes, and I think Moses Ingram, I believe that's her name, I feel like she's going to be really, really great as the Inquisitor that she's playing. Because she seems to kind of be the main Inquisitor mm-hmm. going after Obi, it looks like. so. What did she say? You can't hide from him, or something like that, right? That, that was a yeah, pretty she, chilling like, line. You, she was like, you can't escape him, Obi-Wan. So like, and so I guess the premise of the show is that Vader knows Obi-Wan is out there, and he's hunting him yes. down specifically because it's personal. Yes. I, I, that sounds like that's what's going on. But they've been going after Jedi in general. Right. Because not everyone, obviously. Yeah, I mean, if no, anyone's it's... followed Rebels, they that's where the yes. Inquisitors first come from. Their whole mission is to track down every single Jedi who escaped Order 66 and hunt them down, kill them. They, you know, they go after, of course, Kanan and Ezra throughout the entire run of Star Wars Rebels. And this this show takes place, like, around the same time. Who knows? Maybe yeah. we'll get a crossover with some of the Rebels characters. You never I'm know. I'm hoping. I, I love Freddie Prince Jr., so I really do hope that we will get Kanan to show up. Do you think it'll be Freddie Prince? Do you think, like, they'll cast the voice actor? <sighs> I don't know, just because, like, Freddie himself doesn't look like right. Kanan. But you could do him up. You could do him yeah. up to look like him. Well, somewhat. I just feel like Kanan looks, I don't know, a little bit different yeah. than what. But yeah, I don't know. I love Freddie Prince Jr., so I hope they find a way to, like, do that. I, I think it's possible, cool. like, because, I mean, the the period is not quite the same. I'm not exactly sure what the exact, you know, BBY year it is and which mm-hmm. season of Rebels. Because Luke is definitely, like, I don't know, 10 years old or something in this. I think yeah. it's supposed to be 10 years after Revenge of the Sith, so... Do you remember how old Leia was when we saw her on Rebels? She was seemed older than 10. She seemed older than 10, but then, like, I don't know if they messed up and, like... That was a continuity error <laughs> on their part. Continuity because errors in Star Wars? No way. Right? Because <laughs> it's supposed to take place before... Because Rebels is supposed to take place also before New Hope, so... Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure... Right, because Rebels also, I'm not exactly sure the, the timeline of, of all the seasons of Rebels, because they definitely aged quite a lot throughout the series, because Ezra's a little yes. kid in the beginning, and he's, you know, a young adult by the end. And of course, the, uh-huh. the very last episode of Rebels flash forwards even further, because we see Sabine, and she's, you know, has shaved her head, and she's much, much older at the end of Rebels than she was even in the, you know, the last the last scene in the present context of Rebels from the last, last scene, uh, when, yes. they, when they go off to find... Ezra, which is everyone assumes is the premise of the Ahsoka show. It, it you know that that most likely is, and I know that they are bringing the guy who actually voiced Thrawn to play Thrawn in the show. Oh, is that right? Yes, I can't remember the actor's name, but that's at least the rumor going around. I'm so mad that they didn't bring back Tia Sarkar to play Sabine because yeah, she's I think I mean she may be a little older, of course, than than what Sabine is, but. The Sabine that would be in live action is a much older Sabine, and I feel like the mm-hmm. the girl who they did cast, or allegedly cast, the Natalie yeah. Lou Bordizo, seems a little too young to be that Sabine, and she's also the wrong skin tone and the wrong Asian. So there's all, yes. <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> I did like her in the second Crouching Tiger movie that is on Netflix, by the way. If you guys uh. haven't seen it, I liked it. But all right. (laughs) I liked it and she's in it and like her and Harry Shum kind of have like a romance thing. Yeah, but she's no Sabine. Like Sabine is such an iconic Star Wars character. Yeah, no, I I do agree that it was definitely a miscast on her part. But I mean, like I like her as an actress. I just don't know 
I'll end up actually still liking her in the role of right. Sabine, you know? And we don't know. I mean, like, I, I don't know that they've ever confirmed she's playing Sabine, but I think that's where all the rumors were. And also, like, going back to the age thing, I think that's the other thing Star Wars doesn't give a shit about, because it doesn't matter how old the characters are, because if you look at Katie Sackhoff, Bo-Katan, by the time of The Mandalorian, should be, like, 60 years old. <laughs> yeah, but, like, <laughs> Katie is actually doesn't age well there's bad, so that's so. the thing right like so I, I just i just don't know that like the accuracy of actors age matters because again if you look at you and and alec guinness and all that stuff right like <laughs> people age weird in star wars is all i'm saying yeah, so you could you could I, figure out a way to bring tia surkar to play true sabine in in the live action i'll just say you know the stress of what's gonna happen on this show is gonna just age him yeah, <laughs> he's gonna like, but also I just feel like I don't know if you're gonna be living in a like a planet where there's not a lot of water and it's very hot. Well, that's the like one thing I kind of picked up from this trailer too. Is that I don't know how much of it is actually going to take place on Tatooine. Like it almost yeah. feels like Tatooine is where he ends up, but he's on mm-hmm. the run for most of it. And so because there's a lot of like cityscapes and a lot of like different alien yeah. planets, so I think he just maybe like hops in. And out of Tatooine to check on Luke, but like honestly, is mostly in other mm-hmm. parts of the galaxy. I think yeah. I don't know. I, I'm do- totally intrigued by it because me too. I'm really looking forward to everything the show has to offer. I'm still mad that they moved it from my birthday to the 27th, <laughs> but you know, well, because everyone said like the 25th made sense. It was the 45th anniversary of Star Wars, right? Like that would yeah. be the perfect time to drop Obi Wan, but they made it up to you by bringing two out which which also reduces the time because if they're putting out two on the first week yeah, that means there's only three four. weeks left yeah or, or no four yeah four weeks left yeah, yeah yeah but oh well i don't know if they're trying to reduce it overlapping with you know miss marvel too much because yeah. miss marvel starts june 8th so we're still gonna be some overlap right because you're starting at the end there's like a week a week later it's it's the but i think and that's like they're doing Marvel Wednesday, Star Wars Friday, it looks like, too, right? Yeah, so it's like a week and a half or maybe two weeks in between the release of Kenobi and, if I'm looking at the calendar, right? Yeah. Right, right. It's like about two weeks, I think. Yeah, so episode four and episode one, episode four of Obi-Wan and episode one of Ms. Marvel will be the same week, essentially. Yeah. I have one more question about Obi-Wan, yes. and I think I've asked this before. And I'm just curious what where you are, since you are a big Anakin, Hayden Christensen stan. Mm-hmm. When he's in the Vader costume, yes. do you want to hear like a modulated Hayden Christensen voice? Or do you think it'll be bringing back 90-year-old James Earl Jones? Or is something in the middle? Like, how do you think they're going to get over the like iconic Darth Vader voice when he's in the suit? And also like... What's the point of casting Anakin if you don't actually see him and you only hear James Earl Jones? Well, one, they're going to do flashbacks yeah. for when, like, they're going to do Clone Wars. Like, I'm pretty sure they're going to pick scenes from Clone Wars and they're going to redo it in live action. That's cool if they do that. <laughs> I think they're going to do that because there was a moment when they were on set and they were, and he looked over at Hayden and it felt like no time had passed since doing Avenger the Sith. So I'm pretty sure, like, yeah, we're going to see both of them in, like, their clone war era esque outfits but i don't know i'm okay with it going either way because there could be a whole thing where he doesn't get the iconic voice until the end of the series because maybe he gets in you know the final fight of with him and kenobi on the show his uh, original voice box gets down no but he had it in revenge of the sith so, yeah, yeah. No, maybe they Where will. Is Padme? No. So they probably will have James Earl Jones do it, just because they asked Hayden, and he was like, uh, "No comment hmm. on it." So I don't know if he's like, you know, on set actually, like, you know, he's acting and everything, and then in post they add in actually, you know, James Earl Jones's voice. I don't know. We'll yeah. see. Unless there's like moments where he's like in his head thinking, and then his inner monologue is actually Hayden's voice, you know? I don't right, know. right, 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 right. I don't know. And, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of, like, mask-off scenes when he's, like, all, like, crusty and yes. he's, like, in his chamber, you know? That's why they, I think, paid so much attention in the trailer to, like, the assembling of his robot parts. Yes. Because he spends a lot of time, like, outside his suit, so. Yeah. It's definitely intriguing, and I can't wait for the Obi-Wan series. But but that's since we're talking about Disney Plus, let's let's just get into Moon Knight and the finale 
episode six of Moon Knight and talk about what you thought. You know, I I've been excited for the last two episodes because mm-hmm. I always thought episode four was when the show really took off for me because it took me a while to kind of get into it. Those first three episodes, episodes four, five, six, the second half of the mm-hmm. of the series, I felt like was a lot more interesting to me. Like the kind of exploration of his psychosis and the 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 supernatural bits, but. I, I, I'm I'm of two minds of the finale, but I want to I want to hear what your thoughts were before I share mine. I feel like it absolutely nailed the landing because mm-hmm. I feel like um, besides Loki, I feel like none of the other shows have like or had a finale episode where I was like, okay, yes, like I feel content in like that the story was completed with you know within this season. And so it was nice to actually have it, like, they left it where, yes, they could do another season if they want to, but they also left it where, like, I'm satisfied with what's happening and I can kind of headcanon my own, like, what's going to happen type of thing and I'll be mm-hmm. fine with it. I really enjoyed it. I loved all the stuff with Layla and Tower yeah. Um mm-hmm. I loved all that. And even when they released Omnit, that was freaking cool like i don't know i just really loved moon knight i i think that it's definitely i feel like loki and moon knight are tied for number one because they're both just genuinely so good yeah i'm i think i'm mostly with you i I really liked the finale as a finale for the series like i did think this was the one marvel show that improved for me with each episode Mm -hmm. because all the marvel shows in the past you know i've liked up to a point and then usually like you said by the finale it falls off a cliff for me. This one, I, I actually enjoyed the buildup, and, and I really liked a lot of the finale. I, I wasn't expecting a kaiju battle between a giant alligator and a giant bird skull. <laughs> like, that was... That, on, yeah. on the Pyramids of Giza, that was kind of cool. Like, that was unexpected. And, and it explains why there was so few, like, you know, visual effects throughout the show, because they were, like, saving them up. Yeah. I also really liked the Scarlet Scarab and, and yes. having Layla have a superhero persona the in fact the the scene where the little girl says are you an egyptian superhero like that was probably my favorite scene in the whole Me show too like i'm not even egyptian and i cried <laughs> i was like this is so beautiful <laughs> yeah yeah that was really cool yeah i don't know i get emotional about that stuff and i really liked the Stephen mark stuff even if i thought it was a little corny where <laughs> the way they reunited to be I it. it was like frozen i it was like frozen <laughs> but i but it was just like i'm trying to i'm still just trying to figure out like and this is you know nerd brain taking over like what are the logistics what's the logic of the afterworld in the mcu you know what i mean like i just how does it work like he just turned around and then he was already like <laughs> i don't know maybe i'm thinking too much about like he, he made he made the tri- journey all the way to the field of reeds, but when he decided well, he didn't because, want to, he just turned yeah. around and Stephen was there, and there was a giant gate there that sent them back to their room. Like that was just a little kind of like you know, Deuce Ex Machina kind of stuff. Ironically, since Oscar Isaac was famously in Ex Machina, and I'm not sure I understand how it works, but again, that's at the end of the day, that's just like nitpicking. Like just the afterlife like the Phil to reads or just like a general like what are the after well what are the rules because like, if you just like tell Tauret, you know what i don't want to die and she goes okay <laughs> you can go back to your living body now like well i feel like obviously there was an exception with mark because he was technically sort of somewhat a superhero kind of mm, i guess I, don't know. I feel like that's probably what it was was like or maybe Tao Red is more reasonable than other gods. And she's like, well, I mean, she could go back, but your body's been shot. So I don't know what, what's... <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> like, I, that's, 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 that, that just kind of like... It was almost like they painted themselves into a court. Because I was very curious at the end of episode five. Because like, yes, we all mm-hmm. knew Mark was going to come back. That Moon Knight would show up. Because for one reason, there's a whole bunch of scenes in the trailer that they haven't shown yet. So Moon Knight has to come back at some point. Mm-hmm. But... So I was curious, how are they going to, like, write themselves out of, like, well, he's in the afterlife. He made it to the Field of Reeds. Like, it's like, once you've gone there, you, you you can't turn back. You can't come back to life. But he does, and he just does it by saying, I want to. And that's the only thing that kind of, like, well, took me out. Well, I think she said, she had said in episode five that they have to get to Osiris. Osiris's gate, I think, is where they were. Yeah, they have to get there 
in order to be able to re-enter life. But again, she was like, if you don't have power of Khonshu, you're like pretty much gonna come back here, is what she was saying. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a, a moment of like, I don't want to, I don't want to be here in the field of reeds. It's kind of like you rejecting it, so then they automatically just throw you to the duat. Yeah, but see, and because she did say like, if you reject the field of reeds, you can never come back. So like, implying that once he dies for real. He's going to just essentially go straight to hell, right? He, there's no chance of eternal paradise for him, which is is the sacrifice he accepts. Which, like, thematically, yes, I understand. It's just, again, the logic of mm. how does he go back, though? And the other thing that, you know, and we'll talk about the end credit scene, but then that kind of throws into whack the whole idea of, like, his soul is balanced once he and Steven accept who they are. Because mm. his soul isn't balanced, like... It's split in three, we learn, at the end of the episode. So, like, the fact that he, he and Steven reconcile should not have turned his heart white, right? Like, there's still, a, like, a broken piece that they're both unaware of, but it doesn't mean that, like, the gods don't aren't aware of that this third personality exists, this third soul exists, right? I love the twist at the end when we realized Jake was who Khonshu had been manipulating all along, but at the same time, it, it made me rethink the whole... That's why I was like the Stephen Mark stuff where it kind of took away from that for me because I was like, well, then how did they reconcile their heart if there was like a third guy all this time that they didn't know about that they should have at least had a clue like Tara should have been like, oh, you're still not quite whole. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That's again, nitpicking. But that was, yeah, that was a little bit of a issue I had. I get it. But I feel like also they were trying. I think it's more of they wanted to keep the element right. of surprise for people who don't know that there's a third personality that like there's a third personality like i think that's the whole like point like even someone had asked hey in this this moment is that jake lockley and muhammad was like no yeah he straight up said no even though everyone's like i don't think he's lying <laughs> like, yeah he's lying he's not gonna spoil right. it for you like you know like i feel like by now most people who follow the mcu or like should know when people are like no this is not what's happening is a good time that they're lying i mean andrew garfield spent an entire year spoiler. bullshitting everybody so that's if that <laughs> yes but like People forget that even Benedict Cumberpatch was like, when they were asking him, are you playing Doctor Strange? He was like, what? Who is that? Like, I'm not. He's like, no, I'm not playing Doctor Strange. What kind of question? Like, he was also being like, no. And then people are like, Ugh, I don't believe him. I'm like, well, yeah, he's lying because he signed an NDA where he can't say that he is or he'll get in trouble. Like, I, I don't I don't understand what people like at this point don't get about that they can't break right 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 ways. right I don't even understand why you even ask them like questions like that like when you're doing a press tour and you're interviewing a celebrity and you know he's in something like do you really think they're going you know, unless it's Tom Holland who <laughs> famously lets shit yeah. slip or Mark Ruffalo I get asking them because they're they they just don't give a shit and they'll they'll spoil whatever. But you know, most folks are are more tight lipped, and I don't. I just it's such a waste of time because you know you're just gonna get the same stammering answer. Yeah, it's so yeah, it's pointless. And then it's also like, are you really like? I don't know. Do do you get in trouble for asking the question if they accidentally say yes? <laughs> like, do you also get in trouble for them breaking their? I don't game? think like, so. I mean, that's that's, that that's on them, man. That's on them <laughs> for, for for screwing up. Any other aspects of the Moon Knight finale you wanted to touch on before we move on to the next thing? No, I just, I really liked everything. I kind of hope that, I don't know, we get more Moon Knight, though, just because I really enjoyed it. Even though I feel like, like I said, yes, it ended where I would be okay without another season. I kind of hope we get more because I really enjoyed all the Egyptian gods and stuff. It was very fun for me. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the one thing that I did appreciate, and I said this all along, is that it felt complete like it felt like a complete story it felt completely separate from the rest of the mcu in a good way like you didn't have to like <laughs> which is something i think i'm gonna dig into when we get to dr strange but like you didn't need any homework to like enjoy it and it didn't feel like it necessarily sets up anything that yeah. if i didn't watch moon Knight, i'm gonna be lost when i watch the next marvel thing because i read somewhere yes. that the director mohammed diabs mentioned there was an original idea to include a reference to the Eternals. I think there was even a scene but that they were planning. I'm kind of glad they did it. Not not because I don't like the Eternals, but because it, it was very nice to have a story like you're saying right. was not connected. And that's ultimately the reason they were like, you know what? We just want this to be our. We don't have. To, we don't want to feel like we're 
kind of like Beholden. painting by numbers and doing the thing because that's what everyone expects from a Marvel thing, right? Like, wait, and that's yeah. the, I think probably the one complaint about the show from people who didn't like it is that it felt too disconnected because they wanted more crossover or whatever. But I, that's the thing I appreciated the most is that it felt the most like you could take this and and run with it. Like Moon Knight can still show up somewhere, but it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. You don't have to watch this to fill in a piece of a puzzle for something else. Yes, I do hope that, uh, as a whole, Marvel kind of realizes that, you know, it's such a vast universe that you can tell the stories without having to have tons of, like, crossovers and... Right. Like, yes, I understand worrying about where, like, the next phase is going, but also, like, oh, like, I think it's okay to allow more, like, freedom just to tell this a certain story. Because then it's like, I feel like Moon Knight and Loki have been probably some of the best stuff the Marvel has done in a long time because both story, even though like Loki is more connected to the grander scheme <laughs> of the MCU, it was still like a more concise and like tight knit storytelling, just like Moon Knight mm-hmm. in a way. Like they're both very concise and get to like, they tell their story well and it's great. And I hope that they have more like freedom with their, I don't know, like it doesn't all have to be, mcu formula i guess i hate saying mcu formula well but, but it yeah. is right it is a formula and yeah. and they they break it with moon knight which again which i appreciate because i think the oscar isaac mentioned this when he was doing press for moon knight but what he liked why iron man is his favorite marvel movie is that it felt the most complete mm-hmm. like it's it tells its own story even Yes, there's the teaser of the Avengers at the end, but like that can just be a teaser. It doesn't necessarily have to leave. Yeah. I don't think anyone in 2008 was like really thinking like where they were going to pull off an actual Avengers, mm-hmm. right? It was just like, yeah, good luck with that. But I've always said the the cinematic universe is the gift and the curse of the MCU, right? Like it's the one thing that sets them apart from everyone else, and no one else can copy and do what Marvel does. But it can also become a burden, especially now we're 28 movies deep into the MCU. However many hours you have to commit to like be a MCU completist is like insane at this point. Yes. But I'm glad you brought up Loki because I think that's a great segue into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness because it's written by Michael Waldron who wrote Loki and it deals with multiverses. So let's take a break and after the break we'll come back and, and discuss the biggest movie in the world right now, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Hard Knock Life is being sponsored by Athletic Greens. I want to talk to you about Athletic Greens. With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. Basically all the things. One of the best things about Athletic Greens is that it's lifestyle-friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. It also contains less than one gram of sugar and no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, and it still tastes good. Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant product iterations and third-party testing. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day, that's it. No need for a million different pills or supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is partnering with Hard Knock Media to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash emerging. That's athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So we have this entire multiverse of stories to pull from. The promise of Loki is that, like, there are all kinds of universes out there in the world. One where Loki is an alligator, yes. right? <laughs> Which I, now, now I'm thinking of it, it's like oh, that there was an Amit crossover that could have happened. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> now knowing all in you know Michael Waldron, who wrote Loki, also wrote Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I just what what is your impression of the movie that that you saw this weekend? I like. I absolutely loved it. I think it's my favorite out of, like, the recent ones that I've seen in the last, like, year and a half. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting to like it so much because I was very worried. I mean, not that I don't like Sam Raimi. I was, like, really Mm -hmm. worried that it would 
probably lose whatever vision, you know, Scott Derrickson had for it, which I'm sure it did. But I mean, he I left for worried. creative differences, which is, you know, never yes. a good sign with a Marvel movie. Yeah. So I was very worried that this wouldn't be good. Even though I know they said, like, Michael's writing it, I was still like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but I ended up really loving it. I loved the Oh, my God. The score. Danny Elfman, he did his thing. <laughs> it was just... There's a particular scene that we'll probably maybe talk about later, but like with Danny Elfman's score that I was just like, this is just, this is cinema. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> we talk, Wait, is it, is it the, the musical notes fight? <laughs> yes. Like I loved that, like the whole music in it. I'm like, I really love this and this is great. And for some reason I forgot Danny Elfman was doing the music mm-hmm. until like, you know, I saw the credits, but. And then when they got to that fight, I was just like, oh, this is just, I love this. (laughs) (laughs) It's so weird, but so great. Yes. And it's very weird and wacky and probably like, I feel like some people aren't maybe used to the style that Rami actually has, because if you've only seen a Spider-Man movies, I feel like that's not enough to be like, right. Yeah, I know Sam Rami's like vibe. Yeah. Oh, and this was very much pulled on his like evil dead oeuvre yes. more than his spider-man oeuvre which is ironic since he's doing a marvel movie i know which I, i've seen like some of the evil dead stuff with the show because my little brother watched it the one that stars mm-hmm. did so i kind of like had an idea of like what to expect with when it like really kind of like got into it. I was like okay this is where it's going like i i get it but yeah i don't know i thought it was crazy i thought elizabeth olsen acted her ass yeah off. Like, i'm you know it's, oh. i've been reading a lot of reviews that point out that they they feel like the the movie undermines wanda's character but i kind of don't feel that way i feel like i don't either I, yes she's she, so if you haven't figured out spoilers for everything we we're talking about and again if you made it this far in the podcast and you're mad at us about spoilers it's in the title you knew we we're going to talk about dr strange so fuck you i'm not i'm not apologizing <laughs> I, I don't mean that please give us a five star rating <laughs> If if uh, we want to get into it, like, Wanda is the bad guy. Like, full stop. It's not even, like, a question. Mm-hmm. You know, you meet her for two minutes and you think she's going to help them out. And then two Ooh. minutes into her introduction in the movie, she's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm the big bad. So let's get that out the way. And I think that's the point where it loses a lot of folks who love WandaVision. I'm one of them. Well, I love WandaVision, too. But I'm going to say this. And I'm going to do some Tony Leung slander. Because I said up until this point... Wen Wu is the best Marvel villain. Might be Wanda. It really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Scarlet Witch might be my favorite Marvel villain. Yeah. The thing is, I... So, in the trailer, the first trailer was the only one I had saw. <laughs> right. Yeah, because I spoiled some things for you last week. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> so, in the trailer, I remember that where he's talking to her about the multiverse or whatever. And then they cut within the same scene to make it look like it's later in the movie. Of her being like, well, you know. Don't seem fair. The don't seem fair line. I was like, that looks exactly like. I was like, it looks like a weird burnt version of like the like nice, pretty, like. And also like Strange is wearing the same outfit. (laughs) Well, see, I didn't realize he was wearing the same outfit. I just knew that the like the background or like the scenery looked this Look, right 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 very similar just one was more like creepy and eerie looking so i was like i think that's an illusion that one was mm. putting up so i had thought that and so when they go and visit her i was like oh yeah it's an illusion i already like even before they actually reveal it i was like this is the illusion like it's yeah and the dark holds if you knew from agents of shield it does corrupt you and makes i mean you... it's the one ring it's the one ring. yes Yes. Whoever wields it. So I will say this, like, the trailer does intimate that, like, there was a good Wanda and an evil Wanda. Like, it never hid the fact that there was an evil Wanda, but I think because it's called the Multiverse of Madness, I think, for me at least, the implication Mm -hmm. was that we were going to meet a lot of Wandas and maybe one of them would be an evil one. Uh Uh-huh. But what ends up happening is that, like, there's basically only one Wanda that we're dealing with in the entire movie. And she's our Wanda. She's the Wanda from WandaVision, from Age of Ultron, from Infinity War. But she turns evil because she has the Darkhold. And she's the main antagonist throughout the whole movie. Mm-hmm. But what I think is... what I, the, I, let, me, let me throw this out there first. My one disappointment with this movie is that I don't feel like they utilize the multiverse enough. 
And like the promise of this movie is like, especially after No Way Home, after Loki, this idea like we're going to explore the multiverse. They were only really in two different universes the entire movie, right? Yeah. And and it's not really a multiverse. Like he could have encountered a whole bunch of different Doctor Stranges. He could have encountered a whole bunch of different versions of the Illuminati, right? Like to me, like the fact that the Illuminati was essentially just the Avengers of that Earth was a little disappointing. You know, it's like they could have done a lot more with the idea and concept of multiverse. And that's the one thing that I was a little disappointed with the movie that we didn't really explore, like all the different alternate versions of Dr. Strange, all the different alternate versions of Wanda and really just kind of focus on essentially our universe interacting with this one other universe. You know what I'm saying? I, I get it, but I do also feel like, you know, I was hoping that the main thing was they were going to be able to tell a great story yeah, without relying on too many cameos and stuff. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like they did that, and that to me was more important because, like, I saw someone's review, they're like, well, if you wanted a film that's more focused on Wanda and Doctor Strange and Wong and America then you'll really like this movie. But if you're expecting a tons of cameos, you're not going to like this movie. And I'm just <laughs> well, like... Yeah, I mean, I mean, let me set the... It's not the... It wasn't the cameo thing. Like, I don't... I, I thought the cameos were actually well executed. And uh-huh. I was glad that they didn't focus so much of the movie on those cameos. Like, the mm-hmm. way they're dispatched with is kind of... was my, Like, my other favorite part of the movie was just how, you know, you meet them and then they're gone. <laughs> and they're, yes. like, gone, gone for real, for real. But, well, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, like this idea of the different wandas right like we really only are dealing with one wanda well we do technically have two wandas when you really like because of right right ends up using the is it called what they call the day walking dream walking dream yeah, walking yeah, yeah. the dream walking stuff like she ends up like which was really that whole entire scene of her like going after them was really done well right um, right right and yeah it's just, she's she's inhabiting or possessing the body of the wanda that lives in that and that's the other thing that was again i'm gonna get a little nitpicky Mm-hmm. Like we just happen to go to the one you like the one universe that Wanda has Billy and Tommy. No, she said actually when she gets mad, she's like, "Cause Doctor Strange's like, well, I'm sure there's other Wandas that don't have Billy and Tommy." He's like, "No, every other Wanda has their." No, Billy but, but and I Tommy. guess what I'm saying is that like, but they just happen to like. I, I guess I would have thought it would be cooler if she goes to like a different universe to be with Billy and Tommy, but she, mm-hmm. she possesses this Wanda to, I don't know, just a little too neat to me. Like the, mm-hmm. that the Illuminati and the Wanda and the kids all just happen to live in the same universe. You know what I mean? Like it's the multiverse of madness. Maybe, you know, Mordo's from this universe and Billy and Tommy are from that universe and Wanda, you know what I'm saying? Like I kind of wanted a little bit just more like what, what if did basically like the finale of what if, how they brought all the different heroes together from different universes that's what I thought they would do. And it was just kind of like, it seemed a little bit too neat that everyone just happened to be in this one Earth. You know I, what I'm saying? I get it. But I feel like maybe they thought that What If would be the one show that not everyone would actually Right, watch. right, right. Right, right. So I feel like that. I feel like part of it in mind was like, okay, probably not everyone is watching all these shows. So. Yeah. Although this is the first Marvel movie where you did have to do homework. Because I was thinking like... If people didn't watch WandaVision, they might be thinking, what the hell is happening right now? <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you... Because the last time you... If you if you're just a casual Marvel movie watcher, the last thing you see of Wanda is is her and Hawkeye at Tony's funeral. Yep. Like, why is she this crazy witch lady who wants imaginary children? <laughs> but, you know, that could also be, like, a bigger, like, oh, wow, maybe I should watch the... You know, because right, there's some right, people right, right. who may have Disney Plus but aren't watching the Marvel shows, even though they like Marvel. Like, I don't need or to watch Or people who dipped everything. out after episode one because they're like, what the fuck is this black and white shit? <laughs> yeah, which... I, like, I liked WandaVision up until, like, the last episode. Yeah, me too. So... I, I mean, I loved it. I mean, I, I was bought in with the black and white shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really fun. But no, I enjoyed the movie. Like, yeah, I get what you're saying that there yeah, should yeah. I mean, I didn't not more. enjoy it, but I just felt like, you know, from a script writing, I just felt like they could have taken advantage more of the idea of, like, the multiverse and not just have, have it be just kind of... It's almost like they just went to Earth 2. But there's like yeah. a thousand Earths out there. You could have, you know. Maybe that's what Scott Derrickson wanted. More Maybe. weird craziness. And and also probably, I feel like his would have been a lot more scary. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was plenty damn scary. Like, speaking of like why Wanda is so badass. Like, 
My other favorite scene is is when she's invading Camertage yeah. and she does like the ring girl coming out the window. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, that was done <laughs> really like the way she was like coming through. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is some um, straight up like you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, you could. This is when you're like Sam Raimi's directing this movie. Yes, there was a little kid behind me who I don't know at what scene it was, but maybe it was the Illuminati scene when she started like basically annihilating them <laughs> he, he was behind me he's like i don't know anymore i don't think i like this yeah yeah well yeah that's <laughs> and i was like oh no this poor baby <laughs> it's pg-13 but it it's pretty like intense for little kids like it's kind of yeah. crazy that this movie has like happy meal toys you know what i'm saying yeah i would say this is like for the people who have grown up with the mcu and are yeah. much like at least i would say an adult but if you're like well into your 20s and you're saying that this movie's too scary i think you need to branch out and watch more <laughs> scary movies no but it's scary for little kids for sure yes. like the 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 wanda invasion is is straight out of like like a japanese horror movie but but the the way she murders the illuminati and yes she she single-handedly murders every single member of the illuminati yes and like, and does so in pretty graphic fashion like it's not super gory like we don't see a lot like, of the the yeah. i mean we see some of it though right like the way she peels mr fantastic or oh yeah that's the way she kills black bolt is pretty can, can we kind of talk about how i potentially may have called last week when well we're let's talking. get it all right so that we, we're kind of dancing <laughs> let's talk about the illuminati because that that's the one thing i think you know you were talking about cameos and and i think you know there there's a definitely a certain type of fan that gives more of a shit about like easter eggs and cameos and actual story i'm not saying that was my complaint but i get why you know that that exists but so they they've been teasing the illuminati from the first trailer when you hear patrick stewart's voice and you're like holy shit professor x is in this movie Mm -hmm. and there's all there was all this speculation who are the other members of the illuminati like we all knew x was the one member but who else would it be i spoiled for you that captain carter was in the movie yes (laughs) but what i did not know was that they were going to have Black Bolt, and not just any Black Bolt, but actually yes. Anson fucking Mount from the TV show. Yes, yes. Which, I like him. I'm just so sad that that show was, like, terrible. I only watched well, the I mean, the biggest episodes. surprise, honestly, is that Kevin Feige was unafraid to reference such a shitty show. Yeah, that means that, means that my Danny Rand is always going to be freaking Finn Jones. Yeah. That hurts my heart. You know, I was part of me, a tiny tiny part of me kind of wished Danny Rand was on the Illuminati just so that he could get murked too. Yeah, that, I guess, yeah. But you know, but <laughs> if you're going to reference a shitty Scott Buck show, it makes sense Black Bolt would be the one since he is a, you know, canonical member of the Illuminati. Mm-hmm. So the other member is Captain Carter, Black Bolt, Captain Marvel, but the Maria Rambo Captain Marvel. So in this yes. universe, it was Maria that flew Marvel into space and not, I almost said Brie Larson, Carol. <laughs> and she, she gets the powers of Captain Marvel. Mm-hmm. And then finally, the big surprise, the big, like, Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire scream in my theater was John Krasinski as Reed Richards. Mm-hmm. Which you said... Which he was your pick for the director and potential star of the Fantastic Four movie. Even though, like, I have been saying he isn't... I want Raul Coley to be Reed Richards. Oh, he'd be a good MCU. one, too. Uh, that's what I've been tweeting. So if you follow me on Twitter, you know that, like, Raul Coley has been my pick for Reed Richards for a very long time. You should just keep keep him British, too. <laughs> just to make cool. Reed Richards British, because Raul Coley's British accent's dope. I love Bravo Cauley. Oh my gosh. And it's not that I don't like John Kaninsky because he's literally like my favorite from The Office. And I really did like at least the first Quiet Place movie. And But as soon as they announced that John Watts was no longer directing Fantastic Four, um, I was like, oh man, it's probably going to be John Kaninsky because everyone's been wanting him to be Reed Richards. He's going to be directing it and he's going to be starring in it as well. Um, and then obviously as soon as they showed John, I, I like, I kind of sighed because I was like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> like I called it, but I, I, yeah. So, I mean, who knows? He might just be Reed Richards just for Multiverse of Madness and he's actually not. That goes back to my point about like, I wish they utilized the multiverse more because I think the promise of the multiverse is that you can have anyone, right? That... Mm. The same actor doesn't have to play the same character because we've seen in No Way Home, 
Peter Parker looks completely different in three different universes, right? Yeah. And I almost wish they kind of took advantage of that in this movie and had like whenever Cumberbatch met another Doctor Strange that they would cast someone who was almost Doctor Strange. Like, imagine if the evil Doctor Strange was Keanu Reeves. That's what I was thinking. That would have been so dope if like Keanu Reeves showed up because he was like a fan cast for like 30 years for Doctor Strange, right? Yes. Yeah, so and have I... him be an alternate Doctor or have your boy Ethan Hawke. I was going to say that. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> All the almost Doctor Strange is showing up as versions of Doctor Strange would have been so dope and and would have given more like credence to the idea that Mr. Fantastic doesn't have to be John Krasinski when the Fantastic Four movie comes out. But the way they did like doppelgangers, it was more flash version where doppelgangers look exactly like their doppelgangers. Mm -hmm. And you had Captain Carter looks like Haley Atwell, Professor X. It's not the Fox movie Professor X, clearly. No, but it's, it's a I think version it's of like it's a I mix. mean, it's that universe. It's the 838's Professor X, right? Like, yeah. It's not even the animated one. It's the 838 Professor X. But he looks like Patrick Stewart, mm -hmm. you know? But he has the yellow chair. Maria Rambeau looks like Maria Ram. Like, it could have just been a good opportunity to catch... Like, when the rumor was it was Tom Cruise's Iron Man, as much as I didn't... Was, was not looking forward to that, it makes sense to, that you, this is an opportunity to do something like that. But I felt like they kind of whiffed by casting, like, people we already knew as these characters... It kind of well, it kind of still ties you to potentially a John Krasinski, Mr. Yeah. Fantastic instead of a William Jackson Harper or Raul Coley as Mr. Fantastic, which I still think they can still do, but you're a little bit more kind of tied into like actors you've already cast. Yeah, I wasn't surprised about Maria because when we first saw the trailer, I was like, "Is that Maria?" And yeah. some people are like, "No, it's Tom Cruise." I'm like, "Well, that was definitely a black person. That was not." <laughs> well, I, think, I think most a lot of people thought it might have been Monica. Some people said Monica, but I was like, I think yeah. it's Maria because she had shorter. I knew she had shorter hair. Right, but right, right. Like, no, right. it's Tom Cruise. And then some people like it's Kang, and I was like, maybe, <laughs> but I think it's Maria. So yeah. when I saw her, I was like, okay, I knew it. <laughs> you were right. You called another one. You're like two for two on the Illuminati. I know. I was like, I right, what happened? Two for two. I don't know. I really just I loved the Illuminati scene, and I loved how they were very confident. Like, nah, we got, we can handle a little witch. We ain't gonna do nothing. Like, I really loved that they were just like, it'll be fine. And then, you know. No, and then, like, gruesome deaths for all of them. And, and clothes. And there was one other, like, thing I wished happened in that scene. Mm -hmm. And it's when Professor X goes into Wanda's mind. And uh -huh. he's trying to rescue the, the good Wanda, the Wanda who's being possessed. Yeah. And that was another scary jump scare where you see Wanda come out and snap his neck. Oh, uh, yeah. But I wanted him to at least somehow acknowledge that she's a mutant in that scene but before he even even says she's a mutant or any any kind of inclination that wanda's a mutant he dies <laughs> but that would have been a cool nod to like have you know xavier reference her mutinous in that scene mm -hmm. but any other thoughts how about wong my boy wong and, and america chavez like these are two characters who have very prominent parts in the movie that we didn't touch on I really, I just, every time I, I see Wong or, you know, Benedict Wong, he's just so good. I love him. And then it makes me mad that Marco Polo never got another season. <laughs> yeah. But, no, he's so good. And I just love that he's the Sorcerer Supreme. And I kind of hope he stays the Sorcerer Supreme. I mean, they make it seem like he's the guy. He's going to, like, there's no reason for, for him to not be the Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah. And Give me I a love, Wong movie. I, or even just, like, a Disney Plus series. Whatever. Give it to us. But yeah, I don't know. I love the whole, like, he's like, it's customary tradition about the, like, <laughs> bowing thing. Yeah, no, he was great. But he, yeah, he's, you don't see him as much just because but Wanda actually ends up kidnapping him. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we don't see him too, too much. In America, I really loved her and um, Steven's, like, friendship that develops throughout the film. I It is kind of sad that, like, I feel like they changed a little bit of her actual heritage from the comics because she's Puerto Rican in the comics and... I think in this, she's Mexican. Mm -hmm. The actress is Mexican, too. Yes. So, like, it is kind of like, but, you know, I understand there's not a lot of Latin representation. Well, and, but I think the other complaint about America Chavez is she's Afro-Latina in the yes, she is. comics. Yeah. But I really do like Jolti. She was really great on the first season of Babysitter's Club, but the show's not the same without her. That's probably why it got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was another, and you had been saying this for some time because, you know, a lot of people ship kate bishop with america chavez in the comics but you were saying mm -hmm. that the actress they cast is much younger than yeah. Haley steinfeld and she, she's clearly like a like a very young teenager i think they said she was 
12 or 13 when she was cast and she was 14 when she filmed the movie yeah, so she's very young because in babysitters club they're well like on the first season i want to say they were like 12 or 13 so she's very young but she's really great she's very talented so i'm glad that like you know at least it was a talented mexican actress who got cast in the role versus just kind of like another like what's her name situation from Supergirl. Yeah. <laughs> Italian actress to play uh, America Chavez. Yeah, we that, could have had just, that. that. That would have been chaos. But no, she was really good. And you just, oh my God, you want to protect her. And you're like, no, Wanda, <laughs> leave this baby alone. I, like, I don't know that she needs to be a sorcerer, though. It was a little weird that, like, mm-hmm. she's got a power. Why are you trying to give her another one? <laughs> you know what I mean? She essentially has Cisco's powers from The Flash, by the way. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's to help her actually being able to focus more on her own. One um, Another thing I just want to touch on real quick. Like, in the original release schedule, this movie was supposed to come out before No Way Home. And got the, the order got flipped around. So, I think that's also why some of the events of Spider-Man don't really resonate in this. Because it was supposed to be the other way around. They, I think one of the reshoots is the scene in the pizza parlor where they're telling her about Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Because in the original release schedule, Multiverse of Madness came out first, and then No Way Home. And, like, the whole breaking of the multiverse was going to be a little bit more, like, streamlined. Mm-hmm. So that's just a, a, a little bit of trivia into how these movies kind of, like, fit together. Mm-hmm. And what we were talking about last week about, you know, moving Quantum Mania and Captain Marvel around, like, does that require reshoots? Is that going to, like, kind of funk up the story? Because... You know, already the COVID delays have added all of these barriers. So that's just something to think about. And again, goes back to the whole gift and curse of a cinematic universe because you have to keep all these plates spinning. And sometimes, you know, for pandemic reasons, you can't, you know. Yeah. And I don't know. I still feel like Quantumanium got moved just because they didn't want it to get buried between any of the other movies that were coming out around then. But I don't know. But I feel like Quantumanium yeah. also might be more in line with, like, you know, the storylines of WandaVision and, and Doctor Strange. and Right, because it's got time travel and, and alternate universes and, and Loki stuff. And so as well, because Kang is going to be in it, so. Yeah, so there's, it, it does make sense for that to come out a little bit sooner. Last thing I want to get to before we wrap up is the end credit scene, or at least the mid credit scene, because the end credit scene was just a little throwaway Bruce Campbell joke. And shout out to Bruce Campbell. It wouldn't be a Sam Raimi movie without a Bruce Campbell. Yeah, they cameo. asked him if he was in it. And he was like, I shot stuff for it, but I don't know if it's going to be in the movie. Like, oh, it's Sam Raimi. You can't make a Sam Raimi movie yeah, without he, Bruce Campbell. It's, yeah. it's I knew law. that he was still going to be in it, but yeah. Did you know who Charlize Theron was supposed to be? Yes. You knew right away? Oh, see, because you read comics. I apparently don't read comics. So, so I, when she shows up, I was like... Who the F is this supposed to be? I knew it's Charlie's Theron, but who is this purple lady supposed to be? She's in, I can't remember exactly what female team up comic I read, but she's in it for a little bit. And then she's also in one of the Angela, who they end up rebranding Angela as like Thor's half sister, who's from a planet called Heaven. <laughs> so the, she shows up in both of those. So she's playing Clea. Mm-hmm. who ends up being Doctor Strange's wife sometimes mm-hmm. in some of the comics. But she's actually, if I remember correctly, she's like somehow Dormu Mamu's or some other type of demon's daughter. He's, she's Dormammu's niece. So I did some wikiing after the movie because <laughs> I was like, who the fuck this purple lady supposed to be? So yeah. apparently in the comics, she's Dormammu's niece from the Dark Dimension and yes, she she and Strange have a romantic relationship in the comics. I think she even takes over the Sorcerer Supreme at some point in the comics. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. I just recognized Charlize Theron. And that's the thing, again, going back to, like, casual fans. Like, uh-huh. and I don't even consider myself a casual fan. Like, I'm, I'm pretty, I mean, I fucking run a nerd empire with the nerds of color right? and it took i like i said i had to go like go to wikipedia like who this supposed to be yeah no i knew right away but yeah that was definitely more of a if you have dabbled in some comics maybe a little bit more i just was lucky to have read like literally she's part of she's in it even maybe before like a, a one issue or whatever it's um i want to say it's the fearless defenders mm. it's the one where it's like valkyrie Misty Knight, and then, like, spider Woman's in it for a little bit, and then so is Danny, like, Moonstar, and there's, like, a whole bunch of different female, I think Elsa Bloodstone is in it, too. Like, there's just a whole bunch of random Marvel ladies that are in this comic where it's basically Valkyrie, 
needs to set up her own Valkor because some uh, the Enchantress, I believe, has brought back all of her dead Valkor to like try to take over something. And I don't know. It, it's been a minute <laughs> since I read it, but it's a really cool and fun like comic series, which I would love to see that happen in live action someday. Does she look like her? Like, is that how you knew right away that that was Clea? Yeah, Cause... she's she's purple and she has purple and like icy white hair. Oh, okay. But see, I was hoping Olivia Jing, I think that's her name, from uh, she was also Marco Polo, was gonna be Clea because I could see, really see her being Clea, mm-hmm. but it's Charlie's around, but hey, at least, you know, I like Charlie's, so. Yeah. But yeah, so that was, that's Doctor Strange. I mean, again, I, I enjoyed it a lot, and I read a lot of the criticisms, and I, I don't disagree, uh, but I do think, I you know, the main criticism, I think, so far is that it undermines Wanda's character, but Wanda as a villain is very compelling. And for what it's worth, like, Wanda started off in the MCU as a villain, so if anything, she's just come full circle. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, she kind of has been a villain a lot in the comics, or at least, uh, you know, the antagonist a lot. Mm. So I don't feel like it undermines her character. And she can come yeah. back. Like, we don't know that she died. Like, my daughter I... who watched it with me made a good point. Like, you don't see her body when the when the building collapses, so it yeah, doesn't mean she's even, dead. And and even... clearly, the afterlife don't mean nothing, because, like, you can just come back if you want. <laughs> yeah, and I just feel like with, like, anything that is in the realm of, like, supernatural and magic comic book characters like just because you see the body too doesn't mean they're officially dead either because again there's always some weird way to bring someone back when it's in the supernatural superhero world of things like they can make it happen yeah so like you know supernatural they would bring someone back like if they brought a demon back they sometimes would just change the actor playing them but it's because that demon, quote unquote, possessed a new body. Right, right, right. And again, and that's the the promise of the multiverse is that you don't have to bring back the same actors. It's kind of what they did with What If when they went back and showed Don Cheeto in the Iron Man one timeline. So mm-hmm. that's what you know. Any kind of casting changes is, is no longer a problem in the MCU, and yeah. that's that's kind of cool because then it extends like because the difference between the comics and live action is that live action people age and they grow out of roles and they you know get mm-hmm. tired and they don't or they want to get paid too much or whatever it is comic books you're just drawing them so it doesn't matter mm-hmm. this is a good way to be able to recast without having to you know quote unquote break the story or break the narrative so anyway that's dr strange well before we wrap i did want to give a shout out to the passing of george perez he was dealing with pancreatic cancer for for a while now and he finally succumbed to it on friday George Perez is one of the most iconic comic book artists working. Last week, we we did a lament for Neil Adams, who was another giant in the industry. So we're losing our comic book giants. Uh, George Perez, if you don't know, drew Teen Titans, The Avengers. He, he rebooted Wonder Woman in the 80s. He's one of the most influential and important comic book artists of all time. Rest in peace, George Perez. That is hard knock life. For this week, Brittany Monet, how can people find you on the internet? You can find me at Hi Brittany Monet, and um, you can also check out at Naomi Podcast for the Naomi Podcast, the backlog of the Black Lightning Podcast, as well as the Lituation Room. I know it's a lot, but it's all on one feed. So you can find me on Twitter at the Real Chow, the underscore Real underscore Chow, and at Real Keith Chow on Instagram. Follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color. And go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all of the podcasts in the Hard Knock family. Give us a rating and a review if you do. You can also support us on patreon.com slash the nerds of color. View our videos at youtube.com slash the nerds of color. And with that, until next time. Latest gators. In a while, crocodile. <laughs> all right. Hit play, so check this. this is a hard knock life, but not the chick a kind, more like the people.